All right. Well, welcome to another episode in the Run Brighter podcast. This is episode number 31, and I'm excited to say we've got on another awesome guest today. We got on Jake Irwin, who Jake, you know, I know we connected via the TikTok community. We obviously have a lot of shared passions with running, with coaching, and figured you'd be an awesome person to bring on to the show. So I'm going to hand it off to you first. How's everything going for you today? Uh, well, first off, thank you for having me on the podcast. I was pretty excited when you reached out to me about that. Um, again, I've been following some of the podcasts you have done with Magic Mike, with uh, with Carolyn, and um, you know people that I that I follow and, and look up to as as well as yourself. So, super excited, and uh, I apologize. I'm still a little sweaty as I, <laughs> I just got done with a run not too long ago. Um, you know, the the run addict in me that has to get those miles in. But, uh, yeah, things are going well. I'm excited to talk to you. Yeah, for sure, man. So I think what could be helpful for those who this might be the first time they're hearing your name to get a little bit of a background on who you are about like your passion with running and just a general description of, of Jake. I think that'd be a really good way to kick things off here. Yeah. So uh, you either know me by Jake Irwin or by the cultural runner on, on all my social media accounts uh, and uh, TikTok on uh, Instagram, Facebook. I am the cultural runner. Um, I've been running, you know, I'm 42 years old. I've been running competitively since I was nine years old. And uh, that's one of the reasons why I love to run is I love to compete. And I always use the reference. I don't so much love running as I love racing. Racing is my favorite part of running. Um, running is almost a means to an end for me, but luckily I also <laughs> love running. But uh, at the end of the day, I love racing more than anything. Um, I ran in college, I ran in high school, I ran at the club level, I ran at a sponsored level, and now you know I run at a, a master's level. Um, you know, competing within the master circuit throughout the country, and I love it. Um, it still gives me something to race for. You know, I'm not trying for the Olympics anymore. I'm I'm, I'm past that prime, but. I still get to compete with other masters runners and uh, meet, you know, runners from all over the country and all over the world. Um, and, I, and I love it. So uh, I coach also. Uh, I've been coaching, I've been coaching, I mean, officially for about five years. Uh, I've coached as an assistant coach in college and I've coached, you know, you know, coaching friends before in the past, but now I've, I'm a certified coach and I've been doing that for about five years. Uh, I coach strictly virtually. Um, I do have some local runners that I coach, but for the most part, I'm a I'm a virtual endurance coach. I love what I do. I love, and I started producing online content uh, about three years ago, um, making it big now. I made my first three dollars on my online content. I saw uh, that. Congrats on that. <laughs> Don't spend it all at once, uh, right? <laughs> Yeah, you know, that's what we do for the, the big bucks here. So, uh, but I think that's proof, honestly. You know, we do what we do because we love it. You know, we're not in it for a paycheck, obviously. We're not uh, in it for any reason other than we love to run and we love to share that passion with other people. Yeah, I love the background. Um, I think you've got a lot of, obviously, experience with running and a lot of different areas within running that you've obviously shown value and then I'm sure you're going to continue to share value on your cultural running page. So I'm excited to continue to watch that journey, but also learn a little bit more about your running story here today as, and, you know, really what led you to your content journey. And I'm sure there's a lot of really good tips and advice that you'll have the ability to share with all the experience you've had through the fact that, you know, you've been running since you're nine, you're 42 now over 30 years of running. I mean, that is incredibly impressive some people can't even run for a year without wanting to quit so kudos to you for really staying so consistent with it um but i do want to start with something that you had mentioned which was you really the reason that you love running so much is because of your passion for racing and i don't think we hear that too frequently i think a lot of people they run because they like the easy running component of it of the mental benefits that that come from running a couple days a week. Um, of course, there's more of a competitive community out there with a lot of people who have a similar belief and mindset to you. But, you know, I think a lot of people just run because they want to do a little bit of cardio and 
you know, the racing factor is oftentimes stressful and a challenge for someone to even be motivated to sign up for something. So what has allowed you to really find this love for racing to the point where, you know, the training almost seems like a means to an end for you as you phrased it? Yeah, well, first off, um, I'll I'll say, and I, I tell this to my athletes too, there is no wrong reason to run. Mm-hmm. And that's that's really the power of running is there's no wrong reason to do it. It doesn't matter what your reason is. It's the right reason because it's so individualized. It's so specific to each individual person. And I've had people that have a kind of pointed fingers at me and be like, oh, you only like to race. Well, you're not a real runner or, oh, <laughs> you're a metal chaser. Like, oh, you're not a real runner. Well, a runner is a runner is a runner. Um, that's how I look at it. It doesn't matter how how, you know, what your speed is how many times you do it a day and, or what your reason is for doing it. It's, it's your reason. And that's, and that's meant for you. I've, um, you know, I started running when I was nine and I started running when I was nine, actually as a form of therapy. I actually went to therapy as a kid for some stuff that was going on in our lives as kids. And they found out that, Hey, here's this high energy guy. You know, what were this traditional therapy we're trying with them is not working we need to get them into exercise let's do exercise therapy with them and I remember you know going out playing basketball with my therapist and uh, you know going out on the bike with my therapist and it was you know fun whatever but uh then he took me for a run uh, and this is in northern California um and he, he took me around the Sacramento River Sacramento River Trail yes. and I just remember loving it like I loved the I almost it sounds cliche to say it, but I loved the pain of running. Um, I loved running hard. I loved that I had sweat dripping in my eyes when I was doing it. I loved that I was breathing hard. I loved that I was pushing myself as a kid in a way that I've never been pushed before. And I exerted all that energy I had in the running. And ever since then, I sort of just always loved to run hard. That's that's what it came down to. And well, when do you run hard? Well, as you learn to, to, you know, run and train, well, you can't run hard every day, right? Because that's, you know, you want to follow close to that 80-20 rule. So my favorite times when I was running was when I was doing my speed work and when I was racing. Those are my two favorite times to run. Um, everything else was just fillers, was filling the gaps, you know, so I could do those speed works and I can do, the, do that uh, racing. Um, and you, I see the Prefontaine uh, poster you got in the background there. You know, yeah. Prefontaine used to say, you know, I don't believe in winning unless I've ran flat out, you know, as hard as I can the entire time. And I've kind of always had, had that mindset. I love to run hard and the best time to run hard is in a race. And so I love racing as a result of that. It's not necessarily that I love winning and I do love winning, but I love the feeling of running as hard as I can. So that's really what it boils down to and why I love racing so much. That's amazing. I, I really love that story. And I think, you know, the the fact that at a young age, you were able to take advantage of the therapy that you were given towards using it for something that is such a positive in many people's li- lives. And obviously it's became a lifelong lifestyle and positive factor for you is great. And I mean, I think your mindset with racing is so cool, right? And, and those uh, training runs, the speed runs, the fact that you enjoy the process of improvement, I'm sure, but also the process of putting yourself in a little bit of pain and seeing yourself really grow as an individual, as a runner, everything like that. So I think that's a really inspiring story. And I'm, I really appreciate you sharing all of that. As far as being a college athlete, were you an endurance runner at that point? Um, where'd you go to school? I'd be curious on that too. Yeah. So, and I'll even take it back a little bit further because sure. I think it'll make a little bit more sense. Um, you know, I, I told you I've been running since I was nine and that was really, you know, every year we had a track meet at our little elementary school. So I would do that. Um, and then we got into high school and initially, you know, where I grew up, I grew up in this tiny little town in Northern California and everyone in this town played football. It kind of, if you ever seen the movie Varsity Blues, it it kind of reminds me, like that literally reminds me of the town that I'm from. <laughs> if you don't play football, you're not one of the cool kids. <laughs> so my freshman year of high school, I actually tried out for football mm. and I made the team. Um, I made the team and I was actually on the punt team in football. And I remember our first game, 
uh, you know, the only reason why I made the punt team is because I was the only guy fast enough to get down to the receiver before he caught the ball. Yeah. Well, problem was by the time I got down there, I would just bounce off the guy. I was built like a twig. <laughs> I was not I was not meant to be a football player. And I remember after our first game, we're walking back to our locker room and my coach, his name is uh, uh, Bob Cunningham. We call him Coach Cunningham, mm-hmm. puts his arm around me and he goes, Irwin, Irwin's my last name. And he goes, Irwin, you're never going to be a football player. He goes, well, you're a damn good runner. You need to try out for cross country. And I was like, I think you're right <laughs> because I don't know if I like this. And I tried out for cross country and I ended up as a freshman making our varsity team. And I ran varsity all four years in, in high school. Um, I ended up staying local my first two years of college. I went to a community college in Redding, California, mm-hmm. and I ran uh, at Shasta College there for two years. And then I coached for a third year there uh, as an assistant coach. Wow. And then I went to Sacramento State University. Um, I, I was a walk-on initially, but I ended up uh, not competing at Sac State on their team because I decided to run at a club level. Um, and I was running with Fleet Feet Sports at the time and, uh, you know, various different organizations there. And I just chose to go that route instead. Um, but I always competed, you know, whether it be through USATF or through national grand or uh, local Grand Prix races, uh, things like that. Uh, it was track and cross country that I competed in. And I was primarily a miler, you know, in my in my quote unquote young days. Mm-hmm. Uh, I got my mile time down to a 407. Wow. And, uh, had hopes and dreams of making the Olympic trials for the mile, but that never happened. And, um, you know, got into longer distances and here we are today. <laughs> that's, that's an incredible story. And I mean, the four Oh seven. Wow. I mean, that is crazy. Were you, were you trying to break four when you were in, in college where you said, was it high school or college when you got down to four Oh seven? That was actually a little bit after college that I ran the four Oh seven. So in college, I got it down to, I want to say it was around four eighteen. It was okay. right around there. Um, in high school, I was around a 423 guy, 424, something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was actually after college that I got it down to the, the 407 mark. Gotcha, gotcha. So that was your main race, it sounded like. When did you, I mean, I, I assume obviously you've expanded to some other races since then. Is that correct? What's your Yeah, point? I mean, I had I had tampered in 5Ks, you know, cross country, of course, you were doing 5K races. There was the occasional local 5Ks and turkey trots and things like that that I would partake in. And I liked it. And really after college, I just, I, I knew that I wasn't going to be making the Olympic teams or anything like that at that point. You know, I was working full time and I was just doing what I could to survive as a, as a young adult. Um, so I started focusing on, you know, doing more local 5Ks and then I was getting into the 10Ks. And then I did my first half marathon when I want to say I was 26, 25 or 26, somewhere around there. And after I did that half marathon, I loved it. That became my favorite distance. Was and to this day, it's still my favorite distance. Is the half marathon distance. Nice. Um, and I just started doing longer stuff, marathons and half marathons and fifteen k's. And uh, I haven't ventured into ultras. I don't. I don't want to say I won't, but I don't have a desire to right now. Uh, kudos to everyone out there that does it. I'm, I'm just not built for it yet. <laughs> awesome. Well, yeah. I mean, I think it's. I always find it interesting to see how like everyone develops as a runner as far as like the evolution of the different races that you're doing as you age. And I mean, I think the fact that you crushed it in the mile and then obviously adjusted to some longer races and you're finding a passion with that and you understand what you enjoy. I mean, I I think that's so great. Um, One thing I do want to talk about though, I know you mentioned too, when you were, when you were in community college, you, you said you were doing some coaching. You were like an assistant coach of that team while you were competing. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, and it was uh, both mostly the cross country team that I was assisting with at that point. Gotcha, gotcha. And so, how did you how did you jump into that role, like as a athlete? And and I guess I'd be curious to know, like, how that experience was for you, and what you learned during that time as an assistant coach of obviously collegiate athletes. Yeah, so I mean, I wish there was a super exciting story about that. There, there, there really isn't for that one. It came down to I had completed my two years. You know, you really you have two years of eligibility at the community college level, and I had completed my two years, but I still had more time academically that I had to uh, finish before I could transfer out. Um, and I just needed something to do, and I wanted to run with some people. So 
I, I ran with a cross country team and, and was just offered a spot to help as an assistant coach. You know, that's, that was the way that they could justify me, you know, participating uh, with that cross country team still. Um, so unfortunately nothing super exciting about that, uh, but I did enjoy it. Um, I knew at that time actually, cause during um, my first two years of, of college, I was actually an art major. And, you know, my goal was to work for Disney. I wanted to be an animator and I was, I was all about Disney still am wearing a Disney race shirt as we speak, but um, it was actually my time as an assistant coach with them that I said, I, I think I like this, you know, this sports world thing, you know, on a, on a career level. So I actually switched my major to kinesiology and that's what I transferred to Sac State with uh, as kinesiology with a minor in therapeutic recreation both of those emphasizing in sports and recreation for people with disabilities. And I had always worked with uh, people with disabilities, either on a volunteer level or, um, you know, doing summer camps and things like that. So I was able to, as, as a result of that assistant coaching experience, I was able to identify kinesiology and determine that that's the route that I wanted to go career path wise, which it just so happens I'm no longer using that career, <laughs> that career. And I work in the dental field now, but, um, that's the route that I went when I was in college. Interesting. Very cool. Appreciate you sharing that. Um, now I hate to go back to a topic that we were talking about previously, but something that just came to mind. I mean, you know, I want to emphasize how impressive that 407 time is for the mile. I mean, most people, you know, dream of even breaking a five minute mile and struggle with that. And to, you know, be at 407 is absolutely incredible. I'd be curious, especially because I mean, it sounded like it was after college that you did that. So I'm sure you have a little bit of memory regarding what the training looked like um, on a typical week to really see speeds as quickly as, you know, pretty much one minute, 400s, 101, one and twos, I'm sure were your splits for that race. Yeah, um, it was, I probably, if I had proper training and proper coaching, it's one of those, if I knew now what, you know, if, how do I say this? If I had the knowledge that I have now as a 42 year old with the physical ability that I had then as a 25, 26 year old, I'm confident that I probably could have, you know, breaking that four minute barrier or qualified for a trial mark or at least gotten a lot closer to it. Um, I did a lot of things wrong, you know, now that I look back at it, nutrition was a big one for me. Um, that's probably the biggest one for me, actually. Um, and then I just, I didn't have, you know, a, a proper coach at that point in time. I was kind of just winging it and going off of what I knew. Um, so there's a lot of things I wish I would have done differently th that uh, could have improved my, my numbers, you know, beyond that 407 mark. Now it was a lot of speed work and that's where I wasn't doing things probably as well as I should have. I was doing, you know, pro following the 80-20 rule, we're probably doing 80% speed and 20% easy runs. Wow. <laughs> and it's just, you know, that was 20 years ago, right? That was just something I didn't think about. And I was kind of on my own and just going out and just running hard, right? I love to run hard. Let's go run hard. Um, and now I'm obviously a lot smarter than that and know that that's not the approach that you take. And I obviously don't condone that or teach that to, to my athletes, but um, it was a learning experience. Um, I went out and I ran a mile race a few months ago with uh, just a local race that they did here. And granted, it was on the road. It was a road mile. And I realized I'm no longer a miler. <laughs> um, it's, uh, you know, that takes very specific training to be a miler, you know, from the one mile to the 5K even. It's just a, it's a lot different structure of training. You're doing strength training for the mile that you wouldn't be doing for any other race. Um, you're doing, you're still doing that cardio building, you know, you still need your long runs when you're a miler, but, um, you're doing shorter intervals. You're doing 200s, 400s, you know, 600s, maybe 800s. Um, and you're just, you're, you're getting less recovery between your intervals. You know, you're really pushing your body in a way that you would, it's completely different than you would push it for 5k training and above. Um, but I just didn't know that back then I was. I was winging it at the time. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. I mean, in the last 20 years, so many new studies have came out with running. So I'm sure you were doing the best you could at the time. Right. But um, it's still a super impressive time. So, I mean, I, I'm, I'm very jealous you were able to get down that low. But I mean, with the current knowledge that you have now, I know you brought up a couple topics, one being nutrition, one being the style of training. If you were coaching yourself, do you mind diving deeper into how you would have adjusted your nutrition, how you would have adjusted your training to really see maximum level performance for that race? And then I do want to also talk about like some advice you'd have for some folks who are training for longer distances, because I'm sure you're coaching some of those folks now too. Yeah. Well, one of the things uh, you, I'm sure you've heard it too in the running world is, oh, I'm an endurance runner, so I can eat whatever I want. Right? <laughs> I'm going to go burn off the calories. So it doesn't matter. I'll go eat pizza. I'll go eat pasta. I've I'll been that guy myself. <laughs> and well, and, and I was that guy too. That's, you know, that's kind of that, that part that I didn't know back then. The reality is you can't eat whatever you want. Well, technically you can, but you have to proportion things out differently. Number one, you have to spread things out. You have to be smarter with your choices. Um, and actually, we just did a run talk live with um, run to the table. I don't know if you follow her on TikTok, who, who is a nutritionist uh, or a licensed dietitian. And she talked about a lot of how it's OK to still eat that piece of chocolate. Right. It's OK to have that pie. What's not OK is to overindulge on those things. You have to really kind of pick and choose what you're going to eat and when you're going to eat it. You can still enjoy the things you love, but don't eat so much of it. I loved pizza. I loved pasta. I loved ice cream. You know, I loved cheeseburgers. And I took advantage of the fact that I had this incredibly high metabolism where I was like, well, I'll still burn through these calories and it's not going to matter. I'm not going to gain weight. Well, maybe I wasn't gaining weight, but it was still affecting my blood flow, which was still affecting my ability to recover from my workouts, which was still affecting my ability to sleep properly, um, which was still affecting my digestive system, right? You know, those, those things all kind of all bleed together. And I could have grown muscle at a faster rate had I been eating healthier. I could have recovered more from uh, the runs that I was doing. I was running harder than I should have, uh, more often than I should have. But I probably could have recovered better from those if I was eating properly. So that's the biggest thing. Nutrition has such an impact on you. And I've also learned for those you know, teenagers and those 20-year-olds that are just eating whatever they want now, thinking that it has no effect on them because they don't see the effects right then and there. Well, you're going to see those effects when you turn 30, when you turn 35, when you turn 40. Everything you do then affects you when you get older. Um, and that's, I actually did a video on Run Talk about, you know, if giving tips to those runner younger or those younger runners. And that was one of the tips that I gave was nutrition. Hit the gym more, nutrition better, sleep more. Like these are all things that you take advantage of in your youth that if you want to be a long time runner, you know, be smart about it at a younger age. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. And so, I mean, I'm sure the, the advice on nutrition that goes for both, you know, short distance and long distance running, I think regardless it's, it's, it's crucial really. And I, I think what you talked about with the, with the blood flow concept of it, like that's something you don't hear a lot. Right. I mean, I think people just think, oh, it's based on how skinny you are, or how strong you are. That's how your performance will be affected. But the recovery and sleep component of it, that's so huge. So I'm, I'm really glad you brought up those topics. Now, I mean, on, on like the training side of things though, what, what tips and advice have you really shared with some of the runners that you've coached that you've really seen a lot of impact um, as far as both performance, longevity with running, like staying consistent with it? What are some best practices that you, you typically share? Yeah, the number one thing I say is definitely listen to your body. And I know that sounds cliche. Everyone says that, but it's it's so true. Listen to your body. If you're starting to feel a muscle strain in your leg, well, guess what? We need to figure out what that strain is coming from because we don't want to just keep running and hope it goes away. Where's it coming from? Um, so listen to your body is number one. Um, and then you always hear, hear it, but I'm going to say it again, take your easy days, easy, take your hard days hard. And I think a lot of people so focus so much on that easy part, right? Like, oh, I just, I need to make sure my easy days are easy. Well, those same people really need to make sure that those hard days are truly hard days. 
Uh, and I see it, especially in younger runners, and I'm talking about younger, younger runners, we're talking 12, 13, 14 year olds, where they're still being coached for their, their track team, their, their freshman year, and they're doing a track workout, but they're giggling, you know, they're having fun, they're joking around in the middle of their interval. I'm like, man, you're not pushing yourself the way that you need to push yourself if you want to see the results that you want to see. The harder you push yourself now, the better your results are going to be come race day. So take your easy days easy, definitely, but don't forget to really push yourself on those hard days. Do what you're supposed to do. Don't hold back. Um, so that, that, that's probably the biggest two tips. Listen to your body, push on the hard days, easy on the easy days, and um, take your time. And what I mean by that, and this goes mostly for those newer runners, those uh, weren't runs, uh, those people that are getting into running for the first time, take your time. You know, you're you're going to be able to run tomorrow and the day after that and the day after that. Don't sweat it if you have to miss a day. Don't sweat it if, uh, you know, you're feeling sore today and you just, you don't feel like running. Because the last thing you want to do is force yourself to run and learn to hate running. You want to, you want to love running, you know, no one's going to go do it if they hate it. So if you find yourself disapproving of your runs, if you find yourself uh, just not enjoying it, let's find a way to make you enjoy it. Let's put you in a, in a terrain that you love. Maybe it's on trail, maybe it's on the track, maybe it's on the road. Let's get you in a group of people that you, you know, you can interact with while you're running, but learn to enjoy it, take your time with it. And um, I think the rest will kind of all come together at the end. One thing I do want to ask, because I, I noticed you made like a, a TikTok video about, about it. You were showing all your medals, all your bibs, and you wanted people to guess how many races you've done. Um, I wasn't able to, to find through the comments how many you've actually done, but I'd be really curious. Ooh, that's, um, I don't have the data in front of me, but I, yeah, I know the video you're referring to. So or approximate, you know, we don't, yeah. we won't hold you to it. We won't, we won't check. Yeah. You. So that, that, that video for reference, all those medals that you saw and, and the bibs, cause I have all my bibs. I display all those. Um, that's everything that I had saved. I want to say it was since uh, 2017, I think, uh, or some, somewhere around there. And so I wanted people to guess, you know, how many races have I done since 2017? Cause that's the only tangible evidence that I have uh, that I, cause I started saving those medals and saving, saving those bibs. Prior to that, I never saved anything. Uh, I wish I had. So I have no way of tracking prior to that, you know, just what I did. What I can tell you now is since 2017, altogether, I've, I've done well over 240 races. Um, I've done quite a bit. And part of that is uh, the team that I run for now, for example, I actually race for a local running company here called First Place Sports. And they have a club team and they have an elite team and you have to be invited onto the elite team, which I got invited onto their elite team. But part of the commitment to, to be on their elite team is you have to race um, in a, a number of their races that they do. So they do a total of 22 races a year as part of their Grand Prix series. I have to race in a minimum of 16 of them wow. just, in this, just in this Grand Prix series that they put on. And, you know, we're scored throughout each race and it's for all of Florida, Northern Florida in particular. So with that team alone, I'm locked into a minimum of 16 races a year. Then I had the other races that I want to train for, you know, the bigger, like the Chicago marathons or the Boston marathons, the half marathons, uh, things like that. So I average probably right around 30-ish races a year, I'm guessing. Uh, but that's anything from most, you know, like I said, I've done the mile race a few months ago to the marathon distance. Uh, most of them are probably 5Ks and 10Ks. Um, the half marathon is still my favorite distance. But I just, I love doing it. You know, it's a lot of people would probably look at that number and be like, you're crazy. You're racing too much. But that's why I love to run is so I can do those races. For the next four weekends, actually, starting this coming weekend, I have a race every single weekend, wow. and I'm pumped about it. <laughs> I'm more excited to do that. So, yeah, it, it goes back to there's no wrong reason to do it. I do it because I love to race. And if I had my my way, and, of course, the physically the ability to do it, I would race every single day. That's crazy. 
I mean, bro, so much respect for that. I mean, because I think there's so many people like after a race, they need to like spend months recovering, but to do 16 minimum through an organization you're part of, and then most likely signing up for many, many more throughout the year. I mean, that, that's, that's really incredible that you have that mindset with that. So I appreciate you sharing. Now, one thing I'd be curious about, and, you know, not, not to try to stump you here, but with, with you doing so many different races, I'd be curious if you one have like a favorite race you've done, like as far as maybe it was the course, maybe it was the experience that surrounded it. Um, you know, wouldn't necessarily tie it to like your time, but a separate question would be, what would you say would be your biggest achievement in running in your opinion? And then the third question being, what is there like a specific race or achievement within running or even both that you're you're seeking for the future whether that's in 2023 or for years to come either or yeah so i can tell you right off the bat my favorite race that i've ever you already know my favorite distance which is a half marathon yeah that's my true. favorite race is actually the syracuse uh, new york half marathon and uh last year syracuse actually hosted the usatf masters national half marathon championships mm -hmm. so prior to that I've, i'd already done the syracuse half marathon a number of times and then i got into the master circuit and then it just so happened that that course which was my favorite course and my favorite race is now hosting the national half marathon championships so now i get to go compete at the highest level you know within usatf masters on my favorite course in my favorite race like it's it was I loved it. it. It's it's so fun. Um, it's in Syracuse, New York. It's a beautiful course. Number one, it's it's not super hilly, but it's got some hills on it enough to make it you know challenging. Um, it's at a time of the year where it can still be pretty cold, and or it can be it could be anywhere from the the low teens to the the mid fifties. Um, they had a blizzard one year on it, but. It's, it's usually optimal weather when it comes to running. It's right around that 40 to 45 degree mark. And then the half marathon, like that's perfect, perfect weather. And then they have the best post-race party out of any right. half marathon, any marathon. I'm talking Boston, Chicago, New York. It is the best post-race party, a live band. It's inside their atrium, their, their indoor stadium that they have. Um, it's hosted by Burn Dairy Farms, which is a, um, a milk or dairy factory out there. So you got chocolate milk all over the place. And I love my chocolate milk. <laughs> they give you pizza, burgers, beer, just it's a, it's so good. <laughs> and their medals are epic. I wish I was in my other studio right now to go show you their medals. Um, and even the jacket, you, you know, most people, most races, you get a shirt or a long sleeve shirt, maybe a sweatshirt. Here they give you a jacket and the jacket itself is worth more than what you pay for for registration for this race. Wow. Like it's a really cool race. Um, so I highly condone it. Anyone listening, anyone watching, check out the Syracuse half marathon. Unfortunately, this year it's the day before the Boston marathon. So oh <laughs> that's probably going to take away some competition, but uh so I hope that answers that question. That's my favorite really race. Yeah, that's awesome. I didn't even know much about that race. So thanks for sharing that. Yeah, I still, so I live in Florida now. I was living in New York. I'm originally from California, but even in Florida, I still fly up there to do that Syracuse half marathon. It's, if I can, I will do that every single year. I love it. Um, in terms of my goal, you know, what am I looking for? Uh, I think you had asked uh, around that. Mm -hmm. That was really, like I said, I'm 42, you know, I, I've had to reevaluate my goals as a, as a master's runner and my goals are, is kind of broad. I basically want to compete at the highest level I can as a master's runner. Um, I've accepted that, you know, again, I'm no longer going to be able to run with some of those 20 year olds anymore. Right. Uh, but I want to be one of the top master's runners. And that's why I love the circuit that I race in now here, um, here in Florida is there's a ton of competitive masters runners here that keep me motivated. And, and we kind of go back and forth and take turns, you know, this guy's going to get first this time, but I'm going to beat him by five seconds this time. And um, there's a group of about probably five to seven of us that are kind of all right there, just competing hardcore with each other at all these races. So I know it's kind of a broad goal, but my goal is just to, you know, place and masters at 
at every race that I do. Um, big races, small races, local races. I want, I want to be a top masters runner. That's really cool. And do you mind explaining what a masters runner is for those who may not be familiar with the term? Yeah, it's kind of funny. I remember being a kid and I remember uh, watching on TV, it was golf and they had, it was the, the masters, like golf, the masters championships or something they, they called it. I don't remember because I don't know anything about golf. <laughs> I remember as a kid, I associated that with masters of the universe, you know, He-Man and Skeletor. <laughs> and so I was like, oh, masters, that's so cool. I want to be a masters. And I, I didn't know at the time it meant that you're old. That's, the, <laughs> that's, that's what it comes down to. But masters in terms of uh, American running is because it actually is different based on what country you're in. Uh, but for American running, a master's runner is anyone that's 40 years old or older. and you're automatically competing within a master's division as a, as a 40 plus year old runner. And they have uh, even, you know, 70 plus divisions, uh, you know, super master runners, uh, ultra masters, things like that. Um, but USATF has a master's division that, you know, these high level masters runners, some of them are former Olympians and former Olympic trial athletes that now compete within the master's division of USATF. Um, so there's some very, very high level runners within that master's world that I really look up to and hope to one day, you know, be at their level, but um, I'm still considered a young master's runner. So I got time <laughs> to, to get up there. That's really cool. Yeah. Thanks for sharing the information and yeah. Best of luck on all your goals that you have being a, you know, top placing master's runner. I'm, I'm excited to, you know, hear about some of the stories about some of the upcoming races you have. So, you know, best of luck with all that. Well, but, thank um, you, yeah. yeah, of course, of course. But I, I do want to, you know, I want to be, you know, aware of time here. But one thing I really wanted to talk about was, you know, your content creation journey, because I think it's one thing to run, but it's another thing to run and create content around it. I think there's there's really uh, two type of, types of people in that arena. And so, first of all, the name Cultural Runner, what what drove you to actually go forward with that name for your, your personal brand? Yeah, it's. I'm glad you asked that. I actually did a video on this too, uh, where I actually, I posted questions out there, you know, why do you have the name that you have? And I explained my name. Um, I wanted a name, you know, I wanted a name that defined my passions in general. Now running is a passion. So there goes that word runner. But another passion I have is traveling. And my wife, for example, is from Thailand. You know, we have a, a place in Thailand that we go to. We have, I have a daughter now who's half Thai, half, uh, half American. And um, I've traveled, you know, from Canada to Mexico, to Haiti, to Thailand, of course, to, um, to Korea, to, you know, just, I've traveled all over the place and I've had the opportunity to experience all these different cultures. And even within our own uh, country, within the U.S., you, you don't realize just how culturally diverse we are until you've gone to all the different states and you've experienced them. I've been to every state but three. Um, and I just fell in love with culture, with you know the, the different ways that people are brought up and the different ways that they live their life. And uh, when, it, when I blended that with running, especially in Thailand, for example, the reasons why people in Thailand love to run versus the reasons why Americans love to run and um, the competitive drive that these different cultures have versus how we have our competitive drive. And I fell in love with it. And I said, I want something that I'm going to share both passions for cultural runner. I just, let's, let's type it in. Let's see if it's available. Oh, it's available. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> All right. Um, and I really wanted to start making content um, that focused on my travels as a runner and experiencing all these different races around the country and around the world. Unfortunately, uh, when I came up with that name and started doing the stuff on TikTok, that's right when the pandemic happened also. Like, and travel got put to a halt, right? Oh, you're not traveling anywhere now. So um, I kept the name. I didn't get to travel as much, but I still talk about it. And now I'm back to where I'm starting to travel again, at least within the States. You know, we're going to Thailand again in January. We'll make a stop in um, in uh, Korea, actually. And then while we're over there, we're going to go to Vietnam. We're going to go to uh, Guatemala, uh, Malaysia. Wow. And, you know, 
so I'm finally getting back to that travel piece of of the other passion that I have. But yeah, that's really where it came from. Just uh, experiencing different cultures, and, uh, and then of course, you know, runners because I love to run. Um, but in terms of why I started the uh, the whole social media presence, that is a little bit a little bit sadder, I guess. Um, I was actually in the gym. I was in a Planet Fitness in in New York. And I overheard a couple of people verbally just kind of under their breath bashing one of these other runners that was on a treadmill. And this other runner was, you know, on the heavier side, a little bit overweight. And they're bashing her because of the way that she looked as, as a runner. And, oh, she has no business being on a treadmill. She's going to break the treadmill. And I hated it. And I said something to him about it. And um, I decided, well, these two people are probably not the only other people that are naive enough to say stuff like this or to think like this. And this person on the treadmill is probably uh, not the only person that has the types of goals that she has. You know, she obviously has a goal and she's to put in the work to get there. So I wanted to start putting out content that said, hey, doesn't matter what you look like, where you're from, what your background is, what your goal is, running is running is running. And I wanted to inspire those people that maybe have been discouraged to run in the past or have just been insecure to run in the past and really just say, a, a runner is never going to judge you. You know, the people that judge you, they're the ones that are standing next to their weight machine while you're actually out there getting that cardio and running. The people that judge you are the ones that are sitting in their car while you're running by them at a stoplight. Like they don't matter. The people that matter are not going to judge you. And those those are the runners. And I wanted to start putting that message out there in a social platform. And then it just kind of grew from there. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a really cool story. I mean, I think we can easily become innocent bystanders in a situation like that where people overhear people say cruel things all the time. But for you to have the courage to one, say something to those individuals to, you know, try to teach a lesson, as well as on a much larger scale, do what you're doing now and just try to improve people's lives with running something that I have a huge passion for myself, I think is, you know, really great. You obviously took something that is negative and, and tried to turn it into two, qu one quick positive and one over time, supremely large positive in what you're doing now. So I have a ton of respect for what you're doing and thanks for opening up with that, sh that story there. I, I think a lot of people will appreciate that. Well, thank you. Yeah. Um, well, I know we just got a couple minutes here. I think what would be the best for us to do here is allow you to open up one about how people could reach out to you for coaching. Cause I know you do virtual coaching and I'm sure after hearing all the success stories that you have with running, whether it's your accomplishment of a 407 mile or being able to run as many races you've done um, without, to my knowledge, any recent or very large setbacks in your running career. Um, I'm sure there's definitely people who are going to want to work with you. Um, and then also just in general, feel free to, to share your brand and, and where people can find you if they just want to watch your content simply. Yeah, well, like I said, um, at the cultural runner, and that's all one word, uh, that's the best place to find me, whether it's on Instagram or on TikTok. Uh, full disclosure, I, I use TikTok more out of, out of all the social platforms that are out there. Uh, I just feel like it's the most um, socially just accessible, you know, uh, and easy to use uh, for as a viewer and as a user. So I do um, most of my content on there. And then I do have a coaching website. It's called JI Endurance Coaching. Uh, so you can just go to jiendurancecoaching.com. Again, all one word. And actually all this is on my um, TikTok profile. I do have a link tree account on there where you can kind of see my Instagram um, uh, link as well as my uh, coaching link and then my TikTok link as well too. And, uh, you know, I, I coach everything. From, from the mile to the marathon, most of the people that I coach are doing uh, their first, you know, first something. It's their first 10K, their first half, their first full. Um, and that tends to be the, the demographic that seems to work best with me is when I'm coaching first-time runners. Um, that's just how it's worked out. It's not like I planned on that, but that's just kind of where it's, where it's gone with me. And um, 
yeah, follow me on TikTok. Follow uh, Sam here on TikTok if you're not doing it. <laughs> and um, uh, every Tuesday also, I just, I want to, for those of you that are on TikTok, um, I hope you don't mind the shameless plug, but Go we do a, a, a Run Talk Live every Tuesday. Uh, it's myself, Chaser No Pacer, uh, aka Chase Adams, and Carolyn McDuff. We uh, dual host it. And each week we take turns uh, as the host and we bring a surprise guest on each week. So uh, we have a guest that's going to be on here in a couple minutes and I'm going to go hop on to that. <laughs> Amazing, Jake. Well, thank you again so much for joining. Um, this has been so much fun getting to know you, hearing about your running story. So I appreciate your time. And if in the future there's anything I can do to help you out with your brand or anything in general, um, you know, I consider you now definitely a friend of mine. Um, and so we'll, we'll stay connected. And again, best of luck with all your, your journeys, whether it's your running, your family, um, of course, your content as well. And, you know, I just, I just hope for the best for you. I appreciate it. Well, thank you for the time and uh, we'll definitely stay in touch for sure. You got it. Thanks, Jake.